everyone, and welcome to Reading Crossbow. My name is Lena, and I'm here with my buddy Rob. Hello, everyone. And we're here to the follow-up episode to last week's episode, which was my midway review of Starter Villain by John Scalzi. And I just wanted to thank Rob, just really thank you for recommending this this month and for, you know, just the, the time, the part of my life I put into this book. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you it's had such an impact on you. Yes, irreversibly so. Just to get started, I guess we will do a high-level summary of what the book was about, and then I'm going to ask Lena some questions and really delve into how she truly felt about this book. At the start of this book, Charlie's a mostly unemployed substitute teacher. He formerly was a journalist, but he has some plans. He's looking forward to taking over an existing bar, his childhood pub that he always used to drink with, with his dad, of all things. And then he gets noticed that his uncle has died. His uncle and him weren't particularly close, but a messenger shows up and says, hey, we'll if you would be willing to stand in at your uncle's funeral as the only surviving family member, you'll get a little something out of it in return. And Charlie is like, yeah, that sounds like a pretty good deal. So everyone who stand shows up for this funeral is ready to stab the body. You know, make sure the old man is dead. So Charlie gets a little bit of uh, suspicions that something's up and... The rest of the book is a, a pretty fast-paced um, montage where Charlie travels the globe and gets to see what turns out to be his uncle's criminal, villainous empire. And can he survive the other supervillains? I don't know. I'd that say sucks? that's mostly right. Yeah, most of it. Throw in some talking cats, some, you know, some uh, unionized dolphins, and we got a book. Yeah. <laughs> so the so if you were to um just describe this to someone else is there another maybe piece of media that you might say hey it's kind of like this um, oh man i said this in my halfway i'm gonna say it again because i can't think of anything else that's close which is that this is a cartoon on adult swim i mean this is up there with your futuramas um Ugh, talking robots there wasn't one in this book but there should have been with all the tech that they had i mean close enough i mean what's the one i didn't rick and morty i guess is one kind of in terms of humor this book was non-stop like trying to write jokes i actually have a friend who lives in la and he's written a screenplay and you know the feedback on it was not enough jokes and he thought he wrote a ton of jokes but it turns out when you're writing a 30 minute show it has to be joke filled kind of like friends and I think the author sort of tried to do that. This is like a screenplay. Okay. So I really kind of struggled to think of what this would be like. And when I when I thought about like visual media, I really didn't come up with much. But as far as for like books, pretty much anything by like Ernest Klein or Andy Weir really actually comes across a lot like this book. They're all told in the same way with a fast paced you know, quippy type of dialogue, lots of jokes, you know, that kind of stuff. And so those would be the things that would kind of most familiarize someone to what this book is kind of like when reading for me. I, I said it was written for middle-aged males. <laughs> I'm not saying I'm like, you're wrong. <laughs> it was. Oh, man. And it kind of like... I. Some of the jokes were very dad jokes. Like I put, my, I like I wanted to like groan and be like, "Oh man, like this is just like super villain dad joke hunt." You know, you could almost <laughs> have a drinking game with it. We should have uh, done that. Probably, I I think you definitely could have, especially with all the. If you had a shot though, for every time they said, F <laughs> I, "I think you might have alcohol poisoning." Yes, that's a great way to put that. I have never read the word fuck or versions of fuck, stupid fuck, fuckity fuck, dumb fuck. I, so many, so many fucks were given. They the, never uh, ran out of fucks. Yeah, I, 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 I think this almost reaches the level of fucks in Fourth Wing, though. 
are we talking about figuratively, <laughs> physically, because <laughs> there was a lot more f-ing in fourth wing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we downgraded this episode quite a bit, Rob. Way to go. <laughs> All right. So um, I guess also just kind of at a high level, what what do you think the theme that this author was trying to convey in this book? Or, or were they exploring an idea? Like we've kind of talked about like in Poppy Wars, they were trying to explore what makes someone, you know, become a genocidal maniac. What do you think the themes of this book were? I have no idea. Um, I don't know. If I'm being honest, I, 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 I have no idea who John Scalzi really is or how many books he's, he's written, but I'm going to guess he's written a good amount and I'm going to guess he just said, F it. I'm going to write a book about a super villain cat thing and he didn't care. People will buy it because I'm f-ing John Scalzi. I don't know. That's what I think. And then actually there's a spot in the afterward where he says, um, <clears throat> I caught COVID halfway through reading this book, and while my physical symptoms were mild, it scrambled my brain pretty seriously for a few months there. As a result, this book, and then he goes on and on. So, COVID scramble brain wrote this book. That's what happened. I don't know. (laughs) Well, I guess if I was to try to guess on a theme that was trying to be conveyed, it would be, what if super villains were in our world what would they be like it's very polite of you the uh (laughs) because the i mean the villains in this story they're not like super villains there's no superpowers anywhere in this book the closest you get is some um, uplifted animals but that was just essentially advanced technology at this point so there's no superpowers and mostly all the super villains are just coming up with zany schemes to make money yeah yeah i mean that's true it's like the boys it's like corporate corruption really like there's like labs and there's research and it funds you know advancing technology for different secret service agencies like that's it's exactly like what you just said um but the boys is cooler yeah so i remember seeing this like theme like or meme kind of years ago that said you know with all of the billionaires in the world not one of them has become batman and i feel like this story is just the mirror reverse of that like it's like with all these billionaires in the world there's got to be some of them that are just using this to do some crazy you know villainous crap you know i think that's kind of what this book was going for Yeah, Austin Powers, you know, what can I do with my millions and billions and lasers on sharks, that kind of thing. Like, (laughs) and I just noticed you're wearing a Vought shirt and I said the boys earlier. So well done, Rob. Well done. (laughs) Um, All right. So you are a big stickler for description, uh, especially of characters. And I was really curious on how you, how this book conveyed those characters to you. Uh, okay. I, I briefly brought this up in my, my midway and I'll expand on it here, but, um, there was not descriptions in this book, but it was not with, it didn't lack description. It just did it in a different way, which I found very interesting. I would say I admire that a bit in this book because the author, especially in one moment about a particular character named Morrison made me feel like I wanted to be her. Like, if I was any character in this book, I would be this badass girl who works for the supervillain who um, just, like, she has, like, really cool, like, retorts to him. And she just, like, doesn't care what what he thinks half the time. Like, I'm like, I oh, she's so badass. I want to be her. She gets out of a sleek black car. At one point, he says, like, he didn't even notice if there was a driver, you know, or did it drive itself? Like, I'm like, yes, I want that. So, like... The author did not use descriptions at all. And I didn't notice, to be honest, until closer to that midway point. I was like, wait a minute. What does the main character look like? What does Morrison look like? What what do these characters look like? He did a great job describing his cats. um, And I got a good feeling of the characters. So, no, I do not like how the uh, the author described the characters at all. Because he didn't describe the characters at all. But yet mid amount of respect here because he described them well enough that I do feel like I know them because Charlie is this 
down and out character. He's down on his luck. And I feel like that could be so many people and maybe people identify with Charlie. And then I, he didn't write about Morrison at all, but she's a badass and she could be really any character in so many of these James Bond type movies. So it's like, I don't really know how he did it. He didn't describe them at all, yet describe them enough that they could be really, that's probably why I say screenplay. Like one of the characters is definitely from like the Godfather in here. And I feel like I know that this character is like Italian and like hefty and has a deep voice, but was never written like that. So I don't know. Odd. So the, I, I think part of the reason why this is, is, um, this is actually a book that's written in the first person. Um, we actually haven't read very many books in the first person. Um, it's Fourth Wing, Tainted Cup, and Starter Villain. I think those are the only ones that were first person. And the thing about a first person is if the character that it is it's solidly from their point of view, if they don't care or they are not observant, then it's not going to describe it at all. Something like Tainted Cup... Um, he was exceptionally observant. He was trying to observe everything, and therefore you got it. And in Fourth Wing, she's very observant. But this character, despite having a history in journalism, but it was business journalism, <laughs> um, doesn't really seem to really look at those kinds of details, which I found to be actually kind of curious considering his past occupation. I find it curious, too, that he's a single male, and this Morrison chick is like presumably younger. And at one point he talks about her wearing like, oh, she's wearing a dress like she looks like she's gonna go on a date. And um, some authors would describe that as like a daring neckline or the dress clung in all the right places. I'm used to reading things like that. And like, I, I still thought from a male character point of view that he'd have been like, oh damn, like Morrison looked fine tonight or something, but um, no. So I think that there was opportunity for it, even given the the first person dis descriptions. Like I, I think it could have still landed. Okay. Yeah. The it's, um, and I think actually the thing about first person is, um, it actually lends itself to audio, um, audio books. And I mentioned that because as we mentioned in the intro, I was gonna listen to this on on Audible. So I really kind of enjoy when Will Wheaton reads a book. Um, in fact, like the people I mentioned earlier, Ernest Klein, Andy Weir, um, Will Wheaton's read quite a few books from them, and those are all first-person books from smart, quippy people. So there's almost a single voice through all those characters, um, whether you're doing audio or in a physical book, just the way those, those stories are told. Um, and I, but I think that actually lends itself really well to, um, you know, a celebrity type narrator, um, cause it's all being done with I. So I wanted to listen to this in audiobook as well. Um, I had mentioned that and I, I bought the book before I found out it was voiced by Will Wheaton. Um, and then I had planned to listen to the book on this long trip I needed to take with my son. Um, and then last minute, uh, he invited a friend on the road trip so that I couldn't listen to this type of book. I'd already read the first four chapters at that point. I was like, I can't, like, I can't explain this book to the mom. Like if I play this in the car. Um, and so I was like, yeah, I probably won't do that. So I didn't end up getting the audiobook. So okay. I'm glad that you did. So I'm curious. Uh, I didn't actually find really, I mean, obviously there was a lot of, you know, F-bombs, but um, <laughs> I actually didn't find much to be in this book to be offended by. You know, I, I felt this was a pretty tame book, all things considered. Yeah, yeah, it was, totally. Um, but at that point, four chapters in, I didn't know, like, super villainy, like, where this, like, I, I was okay. like, okay, I'm probably not going to touch an audiobook with a kid in the car that I haven't listened to yet. Um, uh, myself and my husband have actually had an unfortunate, unfortunate accident with an audiobook in the car with the little ones that I did not want to uh, have repeat. It came upon <laughs> a, a particular sex scene that was uncomfortable. So, uh, anyway. Okay. That said. <laughs> um, I guess uh, without getting into spoilers, was did any scene really stand out as basically being like your favorite scene? 
Um, if it's spoiler heavy, you can just kind of hint at it for anyone who reads it later. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm like, I, I'm gonna, I'm trying, I'm like, no, I don't think so. There wasn't like a scene to me that was particularly like uh, compelling or maybe you want to keep reading. The, the one thing that kind of did stand out to me though was I really liked the relationship that the main character had with his cat. Um, because the main character has a relationship with his cat before he realizes the cat uh, has ulterior motives or maybe has been working for someone for a while. We do know that there's five cats after all from the jacket cover. Um, so that's not a spoiler. But And so like throughout the book uh, developing and like him learning about like his cat has this whole other identity, like actual, literally, as you guys read about this, the cat has an identity. The cat... I, I I can say this at this point. The cat has investments. Like <laughs> this cat is much more grown up than than our main character is. It's actually really cool. But so like even <laughs> as he starts to learn this about the cat, he still has this really sweet relationship with the cat. And the cat, you know, still wants to crawl on his lap and still wants him to cuddle it. And so like um, maybe there's a deeper lesson here of like, uh, you know, human intervention, you know, things are still what they are, you know, and this cat has been altered to be, you know, a spy, but yet it's, it's still a cat. So I did find those parts really sweet and it, it did continue that sort of theme and that relationship continued throughout the book. Yeah, it, uh, it definitely did. Um, this should be a fun one. What sh which character would you describe as being your favorite for character of the book? Doesn't have to be, you know, the protagonist or anything. It can just be a character that was described well or had a good character arc. Yeah, it's definitely the cat. I mean, <laughs> it's Hera. There's there's two cats they talk about quite a bit, Hera and Persephone. Um, and uh, Hera is just a cool cat. Uh, pardon the phrase, but Kara's a cool cat, and I loved her. Um, outside of that, it would be uh, Morrison, who I mentioned before, um, as just being, being kind of the kick-ass, badass lady character. Um, I wanted to like the main character more, and I didn't dislike the main character. I think the main character was just fine, had a cool head. Reminded me of, like, the character wasn't a dad, right? But, like, had that, like, he had a couple moments where he was talking to some supervillains, <laughs> which makes it even funnier because he's talking to supervillains and he's talking down to them like a father to a child. Now, like, now if you continue to act this way, I'm going to X, kind of. Yeah. So I like that about him, but I also just think that Scalzi wrote so many jokes for the character that it bothered me that the character didn't really have friends in real life. So it's like for as cool talking as he was, as quick witted as he was, as many jokes as his character told, I'm like, you would have friends. Like if I had friends that talked like that and was like funny like that, like I'd keep them around. So I just thought that like the, how the character spoke didn't actually gel with how the character was written. I found that odd. Yeah. Maybe it's because he's a writer. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, uh, I think that's... I, I, I'm not going to disagree with, with those ideas. I think that the character I think I, I lo enjoyed the most in this book was a character that... It, go f*** yourself. Oh, yes! <laughs> that's the character's yes. nickname, at least for part of the book. It's, it's an uplifted dolphin. And he is a... <laughs> He is a labor organizer, a union organizer, and he is just hilarious. Um, yeah. And the reason why he has that specific nickname is because um, he was asked, what's your names? And, and he's like, you know, he's, you know, don't give a damn and I'm go f*** yourself. And, and, and he just keeps naming all these things and the main character latched onto it. And it was just kind of funny that that dolphin was awesome and he just chewed up every scene he was in. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm jealous I didn't think about that because, yes, absolutely. That is a standout character. Uh, <laughs> so, so good. <laughs> well done. All right. So the uh, – now, one of the things that I felt kind of this book – I was concerned about as I was reading it was the protagonist's agency. I mean, for a good chunk of this book, he's just being dragged along. 
and not really like, you know, the one like leading the story. And I generally strongly dislike books like that. Um, how did you feel about this, about, about that? Does that, was, was that a problem for you or does... Yeah, I mean, it kind of goes along with that Charlie Brown description I gave, where it's just like, ho-hum, he goes about it. I really feel like a Charlie Brown-type character does get dragged wherever and goes where the group's going, sort of a follower. Um, and so it didn't really bother me in the beginning, uh, but it did bother me once it start, started getting to the point where he had to make some business decisions and had to start like kind of leading for the company a little bit. And he did feel like a puppet. Um, and I was like, well, I don't... I don't think anybody would do that. I think most people would want to like sit behind the paperwork first, maybe talk to the accountants of the business, like let's talk to the lawyers, figure out what's going on. He's just like, yeah, sure. Let's fly to Italy or wherever they went. Yeah, sure. Yep. Yep. This is my three boats. Like he was just into it. It was weird. Um, he did have a moment of agency, as you say, where, you know, he's talking with the dolphins and that's where we get a bit more of his personality because um, it's been clear that the dolphins haven't been listened to. Uh, you know, they they have certain demands. Uh, they've always been ignored, treated less than, treated more than dolphin, less than human, but they're somewhere in between anyway, but their intelligence is so high that probably should be treated as humans. Um, and he takes the time to listen to them, kind of makes everyone wait. He's like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to hear them out. And I think that's where his character comes out, but it, it could have happened a bit more. Yeah. I, I, I think the only other one that I would say really where the character really displayed a lot of agency was a single scene where he just like kept closing the laptop and yeah. in a way that was pr probably a very dangerous move and so yeah. um and so he really did show some personality and agency at that point but you know for the most part in this book he was more of a passenger to this story the mm -hmm. story was happening around him i I don't know that that's so much more of showing character, though, is showing maybe some inconsistency in character development, because it seemed out of character when it happened. Like, the dolphin scene didn't seem out of character. He was a business journalist. It made sense to listen to their dolphin business. Like, it was interesting to him. Yeah. Um, but when he was dealing with this character that you're talking about, and he sort of takes on this, like, dickish character, and this sort of, like, I was like, where is this coming from? Because it, it did seem out of character, and maybe... If it was his character, I thought we might have seen it a little bit earlier. Yeah, and 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 if anything, you an, an average person would maybe be more scared in some of these situations than he was. He was a lot more carefree in situ in in some situations, and then scared in others. And the the timings always felt a little off to me. Agree. Yeah, it was just. Uh... Awkward character development. I don't know how else to say it. He was he was down on his luck sometimes and, and like acted like it. Uh, didn't have a lot of like, uh, uh, what is it, like want in life, like to progress himself, get better. He did want the bar, but once he saw that there was hoops to get to it, eh, I don't know, that's work, right? Um, and then we just saw him working hard in others. I, it was just weird for me, but... And I Not think he, unentertaining. And I think he wanted the bar more as it was like a, like a guaranteed job. You're the owner of the bar. You know, everyone likes the bar. You know, I, yeah. it, 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 to me, it felt more like that than like even he acknowledged that he didn't know anything about running a bar. He wanted friends. He was lonely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, this may feel a bit short, but it is a short book. This is like half the size of most of our other books. So um, I guess we can kind of get towards the review. We'll try doing more of a multi-part review. Um, and I guess we'll start off with the writing style, the prose itself. How do you, how would you rate that? <sighs> Low. Um, <laughs> for a book that I wanted to read, I like to read books. I like to be taken away. I like to, you know, I, I'm a mom with a lot going on in my busy life. And I've talked about this before. I want to snuggle up and read my book and kind of get lost. Um, I never got lost in this book. Um, it's really easy to put down when things, there's, there's more dialogue than there is description. And when there's more dialogue, less description, you don't feel stuck in a big paragraph. 
Like there was never a moment where it was like, hold on, you know, one more page. You know, I didn't have that. So, and so the writing didn't compel me to keep reading at any point. So I'd have to say it's low. Uh, the generous use of the word fuck was fun though. Um, high prose marks for that. Uh, I jest, but, uh, there was some interesting words in it. Nothing I felt like I needed to look up because context wise it fit. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. Low. Okay. So the, <laughs> so for me, as I mentioned, like with the Andy Weir, Ernest Klein, I actually often for fun books, um, like this kind of first person, real quippy narrative style. Um, this is what I would call like, that's, this is the vacation or airport book for me, this kind of book, because it's one that you, you know, it's not like there's a deep puzzle or a deep lore that you're, you're really trying to, you got to hold all that in your memory and make sure you're absorbing it because later on it's going to come back. And if you forgot that existed, it's going to be a big deal. This is not that kind of story. And so for this kind of story, I think the prose was about right. Um, the way it was written, um, it, I certainly wouldn't want this for my normal or average book, but for fun, you know, kind of books, co comedic type books, I think it's fine. Uh, I, I would kind of say this meets expectations. So I'd say a three out of five for myself. Oof, okay. <clears throat> yeah. I, I don't know how, an, I don't have a number to put on this. I don't know what to do. I thought, again, I thought I read like a play or something since there was a screenplay. There's so much dialogue. I don't know what to call that. Good TV writing? I, it's good TV writing. Okay. If this was for a TV show, cartoon, adult cartoon, four. If this is a book that I'm reading, one. I guess that makes it like a two. I don't know. <laughs> Low. <laughs> All right. So uh, I suspect I see where this one's going, but uh, how would you rate the characters? <sighs> I feel like such a Debbie Downer, man. I'm uh, I'm pulling the show down right now, but uh, low. <laughs> <laughs> um. So so for me. Yes, I, 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 I don't disagree. The characters are not well explained um, as far as like they're not described. Um, but I think for the most part, almost every character felt pretty distinct to me. Like it was easy to be like, oh, that's the Italian guy. You know, that, 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 that's the stabber. And the stabber. <laughs> we, we forgot to mention the stabber. The stabber's yeah. great. He's, he's, a, he's a central antagonist of the story and but um i think each character felt distinct enough i didn't really have to be reminded oh, who is that guy again all of the characters were pretty easy to pick up on and maybe because they were so you know vanilla written but um yeah, vanilla but so I, I would probably say in general this would probably be more of a two for me yeah I agree. He gets an extra, I'd say a one, but he gets an extra point for making me feel the characters through their dialogue, which I thought was very interesting, as I said. So for me, this felt like five movies were going on in my head. Like we have like the main characters, like your normal Bradley Cooper. Um, you get Morrison, who could be like your Jennifer Lawrence, like totally could be like a gun up her leg. This is any Hollywood starlet. Um, and then you get... You know, this, this Grazza guy or Grazzi or whatever his name is, I forget, doesn't even matter, you know, and he's any Italian guy. And for some reason, Joey Tribbiani was the stabber um, in my <laughs> mind. <laughs> and, but it could have been any characters. And I find that almost sad, like, but maybe good. Like, maybe you had a movie going on in your head, too. So, like, The Godfather was splicing with friends, was splicing with any Jennifer Lawrence movie. And it was a whole nut house in here with dolphins and cats. But, yeah. I'll go with two like you did. <laughs> yeah, because I, I, I do think there is room to get worse. Uh, like, And what yeah. I mean is where like the characters all feel the same or they're like frequently working against what you know about them. You know, the, the inconsistent writing. So I definitely think they're, they're, they're lower. And this wasn't it. This wasn't the, this was above that. But they, the, the characters were pretty... <laughs> tame 
Um, okay. All right. So, I guess, how do you feel about the setting? Oh, shoot. <laughs> there wasn't one. I'm sorry. I, I'm the worst. This is going to be the worst I ever read a book because I... He lives in this quiet little town. I imagine it's probably close to the quiet little town I grew up in. There's the neighborhood bar. Everybody goes to it. So I guess I got more description out of the town that he lived in more than anything. Um, the setting changed a lot. So we have kind of that town he lives in. We have um, his, his volcano lair island <laughs> where they run their corrupt business, super villainy. And then we have like the convention center. Uh, which I know is like elegant and, and beautiful. It's this gorgeous, stunning hotel that's been there for a million years, but I don't know anything else than that. Like nothing's really described. So for setting, I wanted to know more about the volcano lair. Interestingly enough, I learned that you can't throw a body in a volcano lair. That's cool. Uh, the body won't just go into the lava. It's too dense. It just kind of sits on top and just slowly crisps and burns. So that's new. Um, I got a very good description on why bodies aren't good to throw in volcanoes. Um, but I can't tell you really what that volcano lair looks like. I know it's utilitarian military. I know that his uncle that died liked to kind of pinch money a little bit so he didn't upgrade it. Maybe stuck a little bit in the 70s or 60s or whatever. But like nothing else. Setting for me was just meh again. Two. <laughs> so that the... the... The Bellagio Hotel, which is not in Vegas, this one happened to be in Italy. It actually, I, I just kept picturing um, the the White Lotus TV oh, show. Okay. I just kept picturing that, and I know that's a Four Seasons, a real hotel, but um, that's what I kept picturing when they were describing this hotel. It's just this, you know, opulent, you know, hotel on, you know, the Mediterranean. But, um, so, so the yeah, second think, white lotus. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so the, the now the problem I, the I think the setting to be clear the setting is the real world. This is the world we live in, with just turned up a you know a little extra, um, where the government basically will contract with these supervillains for their cool supervillain tech, mostly as a form of mutually assured destruction. So. That's kind of where the villains kind of sit in this setting. And in fact, there's no nothing in this book could really say, this isn't happening right now. And John Scalzi knows the truth of the, of the world. That's how close to the world it is. For me personally, I actually, I think I've actually been right where Charlie lives because I have some family right in that suburb, those suburbs of Chicago. So you should that... go visit them. Say hi. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Check on Charlie's cats. <laughs> but uh, so th so that I, I mean, so that felt very real to me. Um, but like I said, it's just the real world. So five out of five, like the real world. What? No, just, no <laughs> you're kidding. <laughs> I, I I like the real world. You gave that a five. No, it's 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 it's. <laughs> I, I'm I'm. That's a. <laughs> yes, that was a joke. Okay. <laughs> I like I reality. Like questioning, <laughs> questioning my working with you. <laughs> but uh, no, I, 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 I mean, for the most part, um, you know, blending it in with the world, trying to make it seem plausible. I would, you know, uh, you know, three average. You know, okay. nothing, <laughs> nothing particularly dramatic or interesting. And three, okay. uh, three is probably generous. I would two is probably more realistic. No, no, it's okay. Let's keep the three. It's, we're weighing it up here. Um, we it needs that. Uh, <laughs> all right, what else do you got for me? Okay, so we're almost almost done with these categories. Okay. Um, I guess the general plot, like how 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 does the progression of the story, like? So general plots. Um, I kept feeling like, even though this isn't a murder mystery, but we just came off of the tainted cup. Um, plot development for me felt like that Adam Sandler, Jennifer Aniston movie where they're on this boat. I think it might have even been the Mediterranean. It's called Just Go With It, where it's supposed to be this kind of 
complex maybe murder mystery and they're trying to not get framed or they're going to get framed for it. I'm not sure. I can't even remember. The plot was really bad. Um, but you kind of know what's going on or what's going to happen. It just seems very like kind of classic Hollywood, you know, wrap it up, who done it, frame who, this and that. And so kind of some of that like framed sort of stuff without trying to give it away happens in here. Um, and it's, you know, it's villainry. So there's, and it's very mob bossy. Um, so I, I think this gets a ton of bonus points at the beginning, just from like the general, the general description of the book to me, as you know, I was this, I was so, 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 so excited for this. Like a guy inherits from his dead uncle, like a, a villain business or like basically a bad business. That to me is very almost actually plausible. Like how cool if that happened. I was like hook, line, sinker. I want to read about this. I want to find out how it happens. And I realized partway through that I wanted that to happen more in like a John Grisham novel, like kind of like more of like this innocent guy. There's a lot of more lawyers involved. They're trying to keep things hush hush. He gets into this business. He's doing the best he can, but there's this mob guy on his back and he's running like this could have been like four or 500 pages of cool, like more dark plot than it was. And so when I got into the book and realized it was written more cartoony in my mind, I was disappointed um, because the plot for me was very predictable. Um, I would never have seen the dolphins coming though, um, had they not have put that in the cover. I think he could have left that out um, because I think that would have been fun to discover and have happen. Um, but yeah, very, very predictable to me from every single moment. There's, there's maybe three or four distinct moments where like a certain action thing happens um and they're supposed to be these big moments and i definitely called the outcome of every single one of them was not shocked was not surprised uh even at that moment in their secret lair not surprised so yeah i wish it was better there's a lot of opportunity with with the idea here yeah two. And, oh you said two yeah Sorry. two okay so for me, I, I was kind of going a similar route where it was, I, I think the book just missed my expectations. And that's, I don't know if that's the book's fault or that's me is the fault. But um, I kept thinking back to, I mentioned in the, in the challenge video um, about the comic book series called Wanted. Um, and in that series, it, it it has a very similar starting prep premise and it ha even has the cool, you know, girl. And in wanted it's the characters called Fox and Fox is just amazing. She's a great fun character. Um, and just uh, what, well, and by fun, I mean, she, she kind of is awful <laughs> in her own way. I uh, she is a villain, but she's kind of this apathetic villain, and it, it's a it makes for a funner story. And I think I was kind of wanting that, and in a novel form, and maybe not without as much of the over edge lord that wanted was. And but this book came across as it was trying super hard to be as plausible as possible. And that's, uh, that's not exciting for me. So, um, could have I... been exciting. I think if, and to not give something away, I think this story, at least part of it could have been written from the grandfather's point of view. And Are you the there's uncle? a lot. Oh, sorry. The uncle. Yes. Yeah. The uncle's point of view. Um, and I think that like having that knowledge, uh, Try not to go into spoiler territory. Having some of that weaved in, or, or maybe we even go backwards and or some retrospect chapters, like from from the uncle's point of view. And I think that if this were longer, like we could, and if this was called a comedy, if I knew this was a comedy, I might have gone in with different expectations. But I think it didn't have to be a comedy. There was too much of it. So if we went in with some more serious chapters, then we had his quirky little you know, nephew come into play here and there. And then we have like the, uh, the serious uncle who has a super villain business. I don't know why I did that voice, but you know, um, and then, you know, 
your nephew comes in and kind of like do 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 Charlie Brown like could have added a whole nother layer but you know maybe that's just not what the intention was but there's there's a lot here and that's what's so cool about it there's a lot of potential this this could this could have done things yeah um that's it I I think I, I think for this book just the plot I think there was definitely a, a lot of room where I think it could have been more than what it was. So you're saying 260 pages is not enough pages to describe super intelligent spy cats, talking dolphins, uh, inherited supervillain business, a volcano lair, and a supervillain convention? It, it definitely was exactly enough for that. I don't know. Might have been a little light. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So I guess the, the final review, how would you write, put all the pieces together? How would you rate this book as a whole? I would not read this book again. I would not, I would not ask any female to read this book. I think it's so very male. <laughs> I feel like I can't recommend it to 50% of the audience. And actually as of today, our, our, our viewers are leaning towards mostly male. So, Hey, maybe it's for you guys. Um, but, um, yeah, I'm trying to think of a single person I would recommend this to. Like, I don't know. <laughs> so it's, it's tough. I guess it's an airplane book for a dude. Okay. That's, that's who I'm recommending this to. So since we're taking out 50% of the population, it can't be a 2.5. It's gotta be less than that. <laughs> it should probably be more than a one, although that's what I came into this conversation thinking it was gonna be. But then you said it's, it gets worse, and that that has to be bottom of the barrel is a one. You're probably right. It's not that. So it's. I think it's a two. I said two a lot. It's a two. Okay, that's <laughs> scathing so, review. Yeah. So my my initial. Um, review when I was really trying to think of how would I review this and or how would I give a number to this book and for the most part this book was it just is good enough it's a it's an entertaining story that you know that you can read while on vacation you know or, or while you're getting distracted on an airplane i think it's perfectly good as that kind of a book this is not you know it's not high writing but i don't think it it definitely was never intended to be that um and so my initial thought was to give it a three but then i rated the tainted cup a three and uh oh and the tainted cup is a better book so i um I'm going to actually go with it. I'm going to join you at a two. Despite Shoot. the fact I really did like this book. It just, yeah. it, it just wasn't really what I was looking for. And I think that's the tough thing with like, just kind of entertaining books like that. It's because we read Face the Night. And for me, that was very surface level. It didn't, I don't think it hits for a lot of people, though it was exciting Western and sci-fi. Like, that's interesting. Um, so I rated it much higher. I think I gave it like a 3.8 or something or 3 and 3 quarter. I don't remember what I did, but it was fairly high. So I think these are just very subjective. And like some movies, like um, I, the first time I watched Napoleon Dynamite was, you know, with a group of people that didn't enjoy it. So I didn't enjoy it. But then I watched it later with people who did. And I thought it was great. Or like your Nacho Libre movies of the world. Just stuff like that. Like maybe I just needed to be in the... This is, yes, actually, a margarita or a cocktail. <laughs> Chilling in the sun on vacation, like you said. I might have rated this higher. So yeah, probably situational. But yeah, for for reading it just as I did here and there, I read some of it on that trip I took. It, it just didn't do it for me. But... Yeah, cool idea. It's it, it's a it's a tough review just because I think it's so subjective. There just wasn't. I was trying to think of how do I describe this, and it came down to the the meme of does this give you joy? Oh, yes. does this spark joy? <laughs> and it, I wish it did. I genuinely yeah. really wished it did. I was really excited about this book, and it was just okay. And yeah, so we ordered a steak 
and got served some chicken. Yeah. So um, I guess for if have you read a, many superhero books before? No, no. Okay. This is this is a first. Okay. I've read a couple other series of superhero books, and they were a lot more leaned into the superhero and the superpowers and that kind of stuff. Um, and if you like, for me, there's a there's a series. If you really just want to lean into the four color, campy, over the top superhero stories, and it's called Andrea Vernon and the Corp, the Corporation for Ultra Human Protection, and it's just. The, the character is, uh, basically, she's just, just the office assistant at a superhero corporation. She's just like the person that works in the office and, you know, does memos and stuff. While all the superheroes are coming and going and complaining about their, their 401k to her. And it's a great, comedic, over-the-top story. That's a great sh one. Or Brandon Sanderson did Steelheart, which is a dark broody you know superheroes are the worst type of superhero story and th that's a great series I, I really love the reckoners so there are great novels in this genre and i would i would actually to the, the viewer i would suggest one of those series instead that's interesting yeah um and you know we've talked a bit about uh, maybe revisiting some books or maybe doing some classics in this series as well. I think mostly we're going to try to focus on like some of the newer books coming out or kind of, you know, in a way what's trending because we want to make sure you all enjoy it too or haven't read it before. But yeah, I'm definitely going to throw in maybe a splash from the past or there. And, you know, maybe maybe when we get some distance from this one, throw in a cool supervillain superhero book for me or something. All right. So I'm looking forward to seeing what you have challenge next week um uh, find out what our pairings are i i i have something in mind that i think uh shouldn't be a surprise but it might be all right and i know that i need to pick out some more kind of like i dare say like girly kind of books get a little bit more romantic fantasy back in here because i think you miss it i think you <laughs> miss that you know daring love interest from fourth wing and i think you want it back rob so <laughs> i'm gonna bring some of it back i'm working on my list for the year but thank you for tuning in please make sure to like and subscribe we really appreciate your support check out our discord below and our links there and we will see you next week with our newest book selections thanks all all right thank you bye